Amen and amen. Well, I'm uh, real thrilled to have General Boykin with us. Uh, he has written a few books. Um, he wrote The Warrior Soul with Stu Weber. He also wrote Strong and Courageous, A Call to Biblical Manhood. Uh, unfortunately, guys, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, those two books have already sold out. He had them here this morning. Still a few more left of this third book, Man to Man, Rediscovering Masculinity in a Challenging World. And he ha he's He's on his way to Ohio, but he has, uh, and he just flew in last night from San Diego. This man is on the road a lot. But he has agreed just during the break time, guys, between this session and uh, session number two, he's agreed to go back to the table and sign any more books if you buy this last one. Um, but it's just a real joy to have General Boykin here. I, I think I met him about 10 years ago. When did you come on with FRC? How long ago? 13 years ago, so maybe 10, 13 years ago when I first met him, when he became currently, as he serves, as the Executive Vice President at Family Research Council. And, um, and I, I have just been in awe of how the Lord has used this man um, before serving as he is right now as the Senior Vice President for Family Research Council, highly decorated uh, officer of the United States Army, so we're very grateful for his service to our country. He, he was one of the original founding members of Delta Force, and then he would later command Delta Force. He would also command the Green Berets. He would retire as a lieutenant general, and then he served uh, President George W. Bush as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence from 2002 to 2007. And um, he is a very decorated, I don't have time to go through all of his decorations, Bronze Star and Purple Heart among them. And he just is a man who supremely above everything else loves Jesus, loves his family, and loves his country. And he's a friend of mine. One quick story before I bring him up, about a year ago, we were, we were seated at the same table at a dinner. I think it was CNP. I think it was Council for National Policy. He may not remember this, but I remember. And we were sitting next to each other at this big dinner thing, and they came around serving us coffee. And, and so, you know, he's a retired general, right? He's going to have his coffee black and thick, all right? I like a little cream and sugar. I'm just being honest with you. So the, they're bringing the coffee around. I said, I'll, I'll take some cream and sugar, and I'm mixing it in my coffee. And he just leaned over like this. <laughs> Shook his head. That's all he needed to say. <laughs> Would you please welcome my friend and a godly man who loves the country and loves the Lord, Lieutenant General William Boykin. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, and thank you, Pastor, and, uh, and I mean that sincerely, uh, for turning your pulpit over to me today, so I appreciate that, and I recognize that it comes with a little oversight. So I brought my own cheering section just so somebody in here would be pulling for me. <laughs> Stand up, Josiah. There's my, there's my rooting section right there. <laughs> Josiah. So, so uh, how many of you in here are Marines? How many of you know what that noise was? Anybody know? It's, it's the uh, Marine Corps mating call, as a matter of fact. So I got to tell you one, one Marine story. So this Marine... <clears throat> goes into a Walmart, he's got his blues on, they are good looking uniforms, goes back to the clerk in the uh, appliance section and he said, excuse me sir, he said, I want to buy that TV right there. The guy said, I won't sell that to a Marine. He said, you can't do that, that's discrimination. Not, that's... He said, I'm not going to do it. The guy went home, came back a few minutes later with civilian clothes on and his ball cap pulled down real tight and he said, Excuse me, sir. Same, same clerk now. He says, excuse me, sir, I want to buy that TV right there. And he says, 
I've already told you I will not sell that to a Marine. And the boy, I tell you, he got furious. He said, I'll be back in here tomorrow and I'll have law enforcement in here and they're going to throw you out. He went home, spent the night, thought about that all night that he wanted that TV. So he came in the next morning and said, maybe, maybe there'll be somebody else in there in the appliance section. And sure enough, there was, there was a woman in there. He walks up to this lady and he says, excuse me, madam, I would like to buy that TV right there. And she said, sir, I will not sell that to a Marine. And she said, he said, why? Why? What do you mean? How do you even know that I'm a Marine? She said, because that is a microwave. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of myself on that one. I got to tell you. Amen. Hey, all right. I, I grew up, at, for all of you Marines, I grew up at Cherry Point Marine Air Station. My dad was there for 32 years, so God bless you all. Thanks to all of you who have served this country. And uh, it, is, uh, it has been my privilege to serve for 36 years. The Bible says the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And the uh, book of Revelation, Revelation 19 tells us that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back as a mighty warrior, Right? riding a white horse, wearing a blood-stained white robe, leading a mighty army, and it even says a sword is coming out of his mouth. A warrior. Don't you think somewhere between Revelation and, and uh, the very beginning of our Bible, don't you think somewhere in there is a place for us to be warriors? Don't you think that maybe we're called to be warriors? Don't you think that maybe God calls us to be warriors in his army, to be warriors that will take a stand and do his work. That's us, and we need to do that. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my personal story today, and, and then I'm going to do something else at the end here. In uh, 1978, I got a call from uh, the Army Personnel Center that said, Captain Boykin, God said, I'm calling you from the Army Pentagon or from the Pentagon Personnel Service, and I'm going to ask you to volunteer for a special operations unit that's being formed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And he said, he said, I can't tell you much about it. It's very secretive, but I can tell you this. This is going to be the toughest thing you've ever done since you've been in the Army. And he said, and if you make it through this 30-day trial that we want you to go through, uh, if you make it, he said, we want you to volunteer to be part of this new unit. It was a Delta force, but nobody would say that at that time. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, and by the way, I need your answer on this in less than an hour. Oh, so I did what all Christian men do when they're confronted with that kind of dilemma. Huh? I called my mother. <laughs> hey, my mother is a, one of those old time praying women. And she said, son, I'll be praying for you. She said, uh, you just do, you do the best you can and God will give you what you need. And uh, so I reported to Fort Bragg the first week of February 1978. And uh, they issued a bunch of equipment, took us up into the mountains there in the middle of the winter and it was snow everywhere. And uh, we, for the next 30 days, we were out in those, uh, in those mountains there. We started with a hundred and... Uh, and 18 men, and we finished with 90. I mean, with nine, I'm sorry. We finished with nine men as we went into uh, the last phase of that. It was a 40 miler, it was a 40 mile hump through the mountains. And uh, I, uh, I started that 40 miler knowing that this was going to be the toughest thing I'd ever done. And so for the next 11 hours and 27 minutes, I was going through the mountains with a very heavy rucksack, about 70 pounds, and, uh, and praying and asking God to give me what I needed to make it through this course, if this is where he wanted me to be. 11 hours and 27 minutes, I finished this. I was the first one through, and I, they took us back to Fort Bragg, took us in a room, and a psychologist gave us all these tests and everything, and and, uh, and then he took me into a little room and he, 
he uh, interviewed me. And he said, uh, Captain Boykin, he said, I'm going to recommend against you being part of this new Delta Force. And I said, why? And he said, well, you're a little bit too religious and, and you rely too much on your faith. And I thought, and you rely on your nose to breathe and I'm going to break it for you. So, <laughs> well, now I'm a little more sanctified now, okay? All right, but... Well, that was a Friday afternoon. I had not been home to my, see my parents in eastern North Carolina that whole 30 days. So I, uh, they gave us the weekend off. I went to see my mom and dad. And I said, Mom, I know God's speaking to you. What, what's God telling you? What's he showing you? And she said, Son, I don't know what this means. But she said, I, 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 Son, I want you to understand. I don't know what this means. And then... She said, but uh, Satan is gathering his forces. Now, a lot of people think Satan was a creation of Hollywood. There's not a really such a thing as a devil. You better believe there's a devil. There's, a, there's an enemy out there that wants to destroy every single one of us. And everybody else that believes in the divinity of Jesus Christ. So, I, uh, I was... a a little bit uh, turned off at that point. Satan is gathering his forces. And my mom just kept saying, son, I don't know what it means. So the next morning I got up and went to the church I grew up in, which was about the size of half of this section right here. And uh, I got down on my knees and I started praying. I said, God, Satan is gathering his forces. I don't know what to do. God, Satan is gathering his forces. And I heard the voice of the Lord. And you say, you heard the voice of the Lord. You hear a little, you hear a little voice. Yeah, I did. And the voice of the Lord said to me, yes, son, but so am I. And I knew I was supposed to go back and be part of this new organization. So I went back to Fort Bragg. The next morning, I sat uh, in a uh, semicircle with uh, the commanders or the uh, officers and non-commissioned officers in the Delta Force there. And they just drilled me with questions and they just, you know, uh, bombarded me with all kinds of questions, and I didn't know what what these uh, things were all about. But then it dawned on me later, and they were just—it was a test. That's all it was. And, at any rate, so they uh, they got down to the end there, and they were just bombarding me with this stuff. And they finally, I said, uh, the commander of the Delta Force was an old guy. He was legendary. He was an old Special Forces guy. He was a Georgia football player. And uh, his name was Charlie Beckwith. He was legendary. He had been shot in the belly with a 50 caliber and survived it in Vietnam. And, and, uh, and the only thing he promised us, and no kidding, was a, a body bag and a medal. That medal sounded real good to me, but that body bag was n lacking a little bit. So uh, he finally said, oh, everybody stop. He said, Boykin, you're a religious man, ain't you? And you know what? I am actually not religious. You know, Pharisees were religious. The Sadducees were religious. I'm not religious. I love Jesus Christ. I love him with all my heart. But I'm not religious. And, but I knew what he was asking. And I said, yes, sir. He said, where are you raised that way? I said, yeah, my mom and dad, they are Christians, and, and uh, they raised me that way. So he said, well, we'd, we'd be glad to have you in this Delta Force. And I thought, well, I knew that yesterday, dude, so <laughs> you, you're running a little behind on the schedule here. But let me tell you something. For the next two years, the old man treated me with contempt. And... Uh, I couldn't understand why. He treated me worse than any of his officers. And I did not understand it until the 24th of April, 1980, when President Jimmy Carter had given us instructions to go into Tehran, Iran, and to rescue 52 Americans that were being held by the followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini. And we were standing in a, in a hangar in Wadi Kenya, Egypt, an old Russian MiG base. And Charlie Beckwith came up to me that night and he said, Jerry, tomorrow 
we're launching this operation. We're going into some, to some tough places. And he said, I want you tomorrow, I want you to get these men together and I want you to pray with them. That was the first time he had shown any interest in, in spiritual things. And I have, uh, if you go to my website, you can see a, actually a picture of me standing up on a platform in civilian clothes with beards and everything. It was Ramadan, so we, were, we went in trying our best to blend in. And, uh, and I just stood up on that thing, and it was about like this. And I just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, go with us and bring us home safely to our families, God. And then we sang, God bless America. We launched that operation the next morning, and that night we landed in the desert of Iran, about 100 miles from Tehran. And uh, we landed in C-130s. We brought uh, RH-53s in, set them up right behind the, uh, the refuelers, we'll call them, because that's why we had them there. And, uh, and as we were refueling one of those helicopters, the, uh, the world exploded. Suddenly there was a huge explosion and fire everywhere. And I, I was about from here to maybe the back row there. And I was walking over there. And then all of a sudden there's this fire. And, uh, and I had no idea what had happened. And I had no idea what to do. But I, I just turned looking at that fire shielding myself. And I simply said to the Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to spare these men's lives in Jesus' name. In that book, The Warrior's Soul, I write a chapter in there about the power of a 10-second prayer. You see, the 10-second the prayer is far more effective than the hour-long prayer that's prayed, not to the Lord, but to the people around us. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the right troop door came open and here comes 45 Delta Force men running out and jumping out of the airplane. I mean, it's on the ground, but they were jumping out and then running out across the desert. And I, I was watching a miracle unfold. It was just like when uh, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up and went over there and looked and said, hey, didn't we throw three in here? I see four. And the fourth looks like what? The Son of God. And uh, I saw a miracle that night, and, uh, and I've seen many since then, but that was really what I would say was the first time I've, I've really been able to identify a total miracle that got us out of there. And then a couple of years later, we were asked to go into a place called Grenada. It's an island off the coast of uh, South America. We got ready to launch that operation to go in and take that island away from the Cubans and the Russians who were building airfields down there that would put them within range of the, uh, the United States coast. Their bombers, their fighters and all could, could reach America. Um, I got up on a platform uh, at, on the loading dock at our place and I just began to pray, for, Father, in the name of Jesus. And all, all these men were standing around and got their arms around each other. And uh, they, uh, we're praying, and, and you could just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit as we are praying because we knew we were going in again into something pretty tough. And we prayed, we sang, God bless America, and then we, uh, we launched that operation. The next morning as the sun came up over the blue waters of the Caribbean, we were coming in on the target. I was sitting in the right troop door in the... Uh, in the Black Hawk, it was the first time we'd ever used Black Hawk. So, uh, and people were on the other side; they were in in the other window, and we were just we were just coming in, and waiting for a fight. And all of a sudden, the skies erupted. We started taking fire from every direction, and and uh, I could hear the pop sound, and it was they were going through the rotor blades right above me here. And uh, as a matter of fact, it wound up getting hit 54 times, and we were still flying in that Black Hawk. And then uh, all of a sudden, as we came up on, on our target, which was a prison, Richmond Hill prison, the, uh, the 
guns that they were shooting at were, were actually uh, 50 caliber anti-aircraft guns. And I just, I'm, I'm firing back and all of us, we were ripping off as many magazines as we could because they were, they were hammering us and we would knock some of them down and somebody else would get on the gun. And then all of a sudden I felt some wham, wham. And I knew I'd been hit. And uh, the, I, the pain set in and I knew I was hit pretty bad because then I, all of a sudden I could see the blood and it was just pouring out. I'd been hit in, up in the side right here, but it didn't go in. It went at a glancing blow, but then I got hit right up through the armpit. So <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was rocking back and forth, back and forth. The pain was so bad and and finally, my sergeant major hit me with morphine, and, and then I was going, come on, let's go, go do it again. <laughs> do it again. Come on, boys, don't be scared. I mean, no kidding. I was, you know, I have morphine. <laughs> Got to be careful. At any rate, they didn't have any place to take me, so they wound up taking me out to a ship. They dropped me off on a ship, and uh, and then they took me back to Fort Bragg and operated on me at Fort Bragg. And, and it will be Fort Bragg again, by the way, just for you guys. <laughs> so um, they came back to Fort Bragg. They operate. I wake up in the, um, I, I have to be careful on this every time because I said I woke up in the delivery room one time. <laughs> And I think it was actually the recovery room. I woke up and here's what they said. They said, sir, you have a very serious injury. And I thought, really? Oh, God, okay. They said, sir, we need to take your arm off. I said, okay, what's plan B? They didn't have a plan B. And I said, well, you're not taking my arm off, so just do the best you can. I've been talking to the Lord, and that's what I told him. I said, I've been talking to the Lord, and he's told me that if I will trust him, he will heal me. And they, uh, they said, well, that's, you have such a good idea and such a good attitude. And I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're not from Virginia, I can tell you that. <laughs> At any rate, <clears throat> they, uh, they said, sir, you don't understand. That's, uh, you're, you're, you can lose your life, not just your arm, because you've got so much shrapnel and stuff in you, we need to take that arm off. And I said, you're not going to do it. Just do the best you can. Well, the Lord healed me. And then I went back and I kind of, you know, showed them that uh, you don't know everything. There's always the but God element of this. So I came out of that. And, of course, the arm they wanted to take off, that's it. And I, I, until I was about, I think I was about 63, I used to go to the gym on my birthday and, and lift 300 pounds and take my little green-eyed wife in there. And she'd squeal with glee. She just loved it. And then in 1989, we were told to go into Panama. It's called Just Cause. We were supposed to go into Panama, take that country down, take it away from a man named Manuel Noriega, an evil man. And uh, we got, uh, we loaded up, went down to Panama, staged out of the uh, old air base down there, for any of you that remember that. And... Uh, we staged out of there, and before we launched, I got up on a platform and began to pray and began to ask God to go with us. And when I did, when I got through with that, we, we just thanked him for his presence. And uh, we sang, God bless America, and we launched that operation. We left, launched that first operation. I was running the first operation. We came out across the canal, and we started into the, uh, the city. And as we came over the canal, man, the, I mean, the world lit up. It was just like Grenada. They were firing at us, hammering us, boom, 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 boom. And, uh, and I could see the, the uh, tracers going right across the nose of the helicopter. And, and that's not a good feeling, by the way. It is. But uh, so we finally dropped down as low as we could, and we came in across the canal, just above the canal, and then we popped up and went straight into our target. It was another prison. It was called Rich, I mean, it was called Carcel Mandelo Prison. 
And that's where they were holding a man named Kurt Muse. And Kurt's from this area, by the way. And uh, we, uh, we came across there and dropped down low right on top of the, the building and top of the, the prison there. We dropped down low. We set the bird down. We blew a hole in the top of the ceiling there. And then after that, we, uh, we started uh, working on getting him out of the cell he was in. And finally, we just blew the, blew the thing up. And, and we got out of there. And uh, we got him on the plane. And we started off. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the little helicopter he was on started to lose uh, hydraulic pressure. And then they realized that they'd been hit, hitting the hydraulics. And it went in and it hit in the, right in the street. One guy got hit in the chest. One guy got hit in his leg and another guy got hit. Uh, actually the rotor blades hit him in the head when he got off and started running. And then, uh, ultimately, uh, Everybody survived. We got everybody out of the crash. But I will tell you that it was another miracle. It was an absolute miracle just because that plane should have gone down and killed them. And one guy um, actually wound up having to cut two of his own toes off because he had, uh, the helicopter had crashed on his right foot. And, uh, but six months later, he ran a half marathon. You believe in miracles? I believe in miracles. And then finally in 19, I mean, in uh, 1993, the president sent us into a place called Mogadishu, Somalia. You know the story, Black Hawk Down. They wanted us to uh, go in and capture a man named Muhammad Faria Adid. Adid was an evil man, a diabolical man. He wanted to control all of uh, Somalia, starting with the capital city, of Mogadishu. When we got off of that plane in uh, Mogadishu and got off on that runway there, I felt the presence of evil. You say, what? I felt the presence of evil. I had a little chaplain there. I went to him. I said, Steve, I don't care where you do it. You get, you get a, some way that you can promulgate the gospel here. You can preach. You can tell them about God. Tell them about Jesus. And he got his stuff and he set it up and he started running uh, sermons every day. Every day he'd have sermons about the gospel. I said, I don't want them going into this evil place until they've heard the gospel. And I don't know who has and who hasn't. So he would, he would speak about that every day and men would come and go. And, uh, and then finally we started uh, getting intel and we were told to start launching operations to go after my, my uh, a deed to go after him and uh, get him out of there and so we could put him in prison. Well, the first, before we launched the first operations, we got everybody together in a hangar and you can find it in my, I don't have any of my uh, autobiographies here, but uh, in there we have a, a picture of me with a, a uh, bullhorn And we're getting ready to launch our first operation and we're praying and asking the Lord to go with us, to be with us. And uh, we we, we launched the first operation about 10 o'clock one morning, which is normally a slow time. Well, you know, it wasn't slow that day, but, but anyhow, we came out fine and we launched six operations into that city. And, uh, and we came out with nothing but a few scratches on our people. And I would just pray. Every time, I, every time we'd launch, I'd just pray. And then finally, the 3rd of October, we, uh, we launched an operation into a place called uh, the Bakara Market, which is a place we did not want to go. We tried to stay out of there. And uh, we launched that operation. We went into the Bakara Market. And we got in a fight. And 18 hours later, 15 of my men were dead. 15 of my men were dead. 
I, uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I was so broken hearted as I was, as I was seeing all of this stuff unfold. These are my men. And I walked over to a truck. This is my most vivid memory of Mogadishu. I walked over to a truck, a five ton truck. And I reached up to help drop the tailgate on it because I knew the dead were on bottom and the live were on top of the dead. It's all we had to get them out. And uh, I uh, reached up and pulled that tailgate down. And when I did, the blood poured out the back of that like water. And I looked at the, the dead and wounded in the back of that truck. It's all we had. And it, and it broke my heart. And uh, then I saw, about an hour later, I saw images of the bodies of, of several of my men being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu and mutilated and desecrated. And all I could say was, God, where were you? That night I, I got everybody evacuated. It had to be evacuated. And I I sat down on my bunk and I began to pray and I began to say, God, why did you let this happen? And my anger towards God was burning. God, why did you let this happen? Where were you, God? You could have stopped this. And then the answer came. And the answer was, there is no God. Now, I didn't come here to tell you that there's no God. But in my anger... I said, there is no God. And the moment I said that, I heard the voice of the Lord for the second time in my life and the last time in my life that I really heard the audible voice, what I thought was the audible voice of my, my God. Is he said, if there's no God, there's no hope. And I just began to weep. I just began to weep as I began to shake. And I said, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, God. You ever done something that you know you have to repent for? If you, if you haven't, you ain't right. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I just said, God, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, but I don't understand. And I said, God, I'm going to open the word and I want you to give me something here. Show me something, God. And I opened the word and it said, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not into thine own understanding. Huh? Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord. Well, the next day we... Uh, after we had everybody evacuated and uh, we were trying to get reorganized so we could, could move on and go after a deed, uh, we had a little service for all our people that were dead or wounded. And then that night, just as the sun went down, all of a sudden there was a, a, a huge explosion. Boom. Huge explosion. And I didn't know what it was. I had no idea, but I knew I had been hit. And then I could just hear the groans and the moans as the people were laying in heaps there. The Delta Force people, the aviators from the 160th. And uh, it was a mortar that had been fired. Four mortars were fired. Three of those mortars went right over us and went right out into the ocean. But the, the fourth one hit right there. Hit right there. And it hit me. And I knew I had been hit. And I'd been hit in the legs. I didn't know what the other damage was. In reality, one guy was killed. And, uh, and 15 were, were injured. And uh, they uh, came, picked me up on a, uh, I guess you call it a gurney, and uh, ran me into a makeshift aid station. And then they brought some more people in, and, uh, and I, I knew that uh, I was hit, 
and I knew that my, I was hit pretty bad. And uh, I didn't, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to react to it. I, I didn't know what to think because God was there. But I was hit and others were hit. And I just, I couldn't quite understand it. They took us up to the UN hospital, operated on me that night. And next day I said, take me back down to the airfield. Take me back with my soldiers. Take me back where my soldiers are. And they took me back down there and I couldn't walk. So I just laid on my bed and I'd pray. And I'd seek the Lord. And I was laying there one day seeking the Lord. And, and, and I said, God, give me something, Lord. Give me something that will help me with this. God, I, I am so conflicted here. And all of a sudden, somebody came and said, hey, Colonel, he said, uh, you got a facsimile. And he handed me this facsimile. And the facsimile came from the man that created the Dollar Rental Car Company. Good Christian brother. And uh, he had sent me this facsimile back to Fort Bragg, and then they forwarded it on to me. And uh, it said this, said, for they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Wait upon the Lord. Well, I want to kind of bring this to a close here by simply saying to you that um, the, the other men that were hit there that day, all of them survived except one. And he was standing from me to that. We were standing right together, shoulder to shoulder. He was killed and I was saved. And all I could say was, God, why did you spare me? Why did you spare me? Why did you spare me, God? He's got young children. I don't. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I don't know what his spirit is like. But the Lord gave me peace about it and said, for they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. So we... Uh, we came home the end of October, and my first night home, I went and sat before the Lord, and I said, God, I said, just, just understand, I'm, t I'm tormented because I don't know if those men were ready to meet you. I don't know if they were ready to go into eternity. And uh, I just said, God, just give me something here, God, to comfort me. And I open my Bible. And I'm telling you, he does this with me a lot. I open my Bible. I didn't know where I was opening it to. But it said, for as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's saying that Jesus already went to Calvary for us, but it was what the Lord was saying to me was those men had heard the word because I made sure that they heard the word. Those men had heard the word and they had received Jesus. It's not any different than that thief on the cross next to Jesus. There were three on that cross. We forget that sometimes. And one of them mocks him. But the other one says, leave him alone. He's an innocent man, but we're guilty. And he says, Father, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said the most precious words in the Bible. <clears throat> And what did he say? He said, on this day, you know what he said? Repeat it with me. On this day, you will be with me in paradise. That man's in heaven today. Now, because he earned it, you can't earn it. You know, you, you can't earn it. That's all it was. He confessed in his own way that he was a sinner and needed Jesus Christ to wash away his sins. <clears throat> we need to keep that in mind. And finally, as I 
I want to bring this to a close. When that mortar went off and I got hit, I went down. My doctor was laying right next to me. He had walked up to speak to me. He had walked up on my flank here. He, and, uh, and he went down. And I didn't know he was laying there. And I started yelling, find the doc, find the doc. I didn't realize he was laying right next to me. And they grabbed me and him and put us on stretchers. And they ran us back into the little uh, makeshift, I'll call it a aid station. And they laid us side by side. I reached out and took his hand. And I said, Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to spare this man's life. Don't let him die, God, please. In the name of Jesus, don't let him die. And I squeezed his hand and I said, hold on, Rob, you're going to make it. Hold on, Rob. Hold on, buddy. And uh, pretty soon I could see the, how frantic the nurses and the doctor was. And I knew he was going and he was going fast. <laughs> I just reached over again and got his hand. I said, Rob, hold on. Man. Hold on, Rob. Hold on, Rob. And I said, God, in the name of Jesus, don't let him die. Don't let him die. And uh, finally the nurse reached down and put her hand on my shoulder and she said, sir, I'm sorry. Let him go. He's gone. Let him go. He's gone. And I just said, Father, there, there's been enough death here. And I'm asking you, Lord, I'm asking you to spare this man's life. Anybody in here that's praying for somebody and they, you, they just don't seem to be responding, they don't seem to be listening, they don't seem to be showing much interest in heavenly things, keep praying. Keep praying. You know why? Because it can be turned around. That man, she said, sir, he's gone. Let him go. He's gone. A man runs an aid station on Interstate 95, 81, I'm sorry, Interstate 81 in the Shenandoah Valley. If you go by White's truck stop down there, he set up an aid station. That man's alive today. That man, she said, he's, she said, sir, he's gone. He's gone. Well, God gets a vote too. Right? God gets a vote too. Amen. The uh, almost nobody there in the medical field believed that he had actually been dead. But last year, I got a call from a church in the Shenandoah Valley, and they said, would you come up here and uh, do a men's conference for us? And I said, sure, I'd be glad to. And when it, I came to the end, and we started to do what we call the Father's Blessing. That man walked in. That man walked in. I know he was dead. You say, whatever you want to, I don't care. I was there. The man was, was alive, and I said to him, I said, you know you were dead, don't you? <laughs> he said, yeah, my watch stopped, and I couldn't figure it out. But, but he, he began to tear up. He began to tear up. Any of you know who I'm talking about? Anybody? anybody you know him. His father was the Secretary of the Army at one time. God brought him back. I don't care what anybody says. God brought him back.
How many of you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Let me tell you something. Put your hands down. I don't want you to leave here today if you are not absolutely sure that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. We all had to go through the experience of confessing our sins and asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our lives. So, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads right now. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I have to ask you to lift these men up, God. Let your anointing be upon them, God. Let them know, Lord, that there is no weapon can prosper against them. And now, Lord, let them know that they are just one step away from knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. And now I ask you, if, if you want to make that commitment today and you want to join, you want Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life, show me your hands, would you, please? Can we see them? Yes, sir. I see that. Yes, sir. Yes. Others. Yes, I see you in the back there. Others. Yes, I see you down here in the front. Okay, anybody else? All right, can I, could, could I just uh, ask you to stand right now? Everybody stand right now. I'm going to pray this prayer, and I want you all to pray it out loud. And when this is over with, I want you to get with the staff here at the church, please. I'm, I'm saying, please get with them and let them kind of get you, help get you on the right path to know that you are born again and you're serving the Lord, okay? So say this out loud with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to be my Savior. Wash away all my sins. Help me, Lord, to walk with you and to talk with you and to keep you in my heart, Lord. I love you, and I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you, if you prayed that prayer, and you really meant that, the Bible says your sins are as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. They're forgotten. And don't let Satan bring them back to you. Because you've confessed them. You've confessed them. And now we're going to do something else that we're going to do it. We do this at a lot of our men's services. And uh, if you look at places in the Bible where it talks about a blessing, there's all kinds of places where they talk about a blessing. One of the places is, is, is at the very end of Deuteronomy when the, really the the great patron was about to, to die and the Lord had told him he couldn't go into the promised land. He could see it, but he wasn't going to be able to go because he had done something that, that made him uh, incapable of going. It says that Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with a spirit of wisdom why? Because Moses had laid his hands on him. The Father's blessing. The Father's blessing. How about the story about Jacob? When he called his grandsons to him. And the Bible is full of these examples of how the fathers, the male, has blessed the next generation. 
We don't do that very much anymore. In the, but it's such an important thing. And I was, I'll tell you, one night I was in Katy, Texas. I was doing a men's conference in Katy, Texas, outdoor event, about 2,000 men. And I told the men there, I said, you men, get your sons. And you bring your sons up here to the altar and bless them. And uh, as they started bringing their sons forward, I saw a husky, big husky guy coming out of the, out of the crowd there. And, uh, and I had seen him somewhere before, but I didn't know where it was. He was a, it turns out he's from right here in, in Virginia. But uh, he came towards me, and he was a, he's obviously a weightlifter. And he walked up to me, and he said, Sir, he said, I'm Pastor Charles Flowers. He said, I'm from San Antonio, Texas. And you just said that if the only thing you regret about your relationship with your dad was that he never blessed you. And he said, if you'll let me, I'll bless you. I'll lay my hands on you and bless you on behalf of your deceased father. You see, a blessing that I'm talking about is a blessing where I am going to lay my hands on you. I can pray for you anytime. But I want to bless you. And, I, and, and to bless you, I want to lay my hands on you and begin to bless you. And I see these guys a lot that you say, now bless your son, and he'll stand over here to the side. No. You put your hands on that boy, that girl, your wife, and every time my family is there for the holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever it is, I say, okay, it's time, line up. <laughs> and they line up, and I begin to bless them. Come here, Je Josiah. Come here, buddy. This is my special friend. I love this boy. I really love him. Harold, do you mind? Come on up here. Josiah, I bless you. I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I bless you. I bless you. You're go you are a man now. And I bless you. Jesus loves you, Josiah, because you've made a commitment to Him. You've committed your life to doing His will and His work. And I bless you right now. And I proclaim that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I bless you. I bless you in Jesus' name. Go as God identifies where He wants you. Go and do great things in His kingdom. I bless you, Josiah, in the name of Jesus, amen. So I want to ask all you men that have a son here, a spiritual son, or whatever it may be, to bring them to this altar. And let's bless them. Let's bless them. Do we have any... Uh, any other ordained men that would come up here and pray with them as they do this? You see, when I met my doctor up here in Shenandoah Valley, we, we both stood and wept as I blessed him. So, would you now, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be praying here, but I want you to bless them in your own way, in your own way. 
Yeah, come on. And if, if you need to, you can spread out to the back there. Yes, sir. God bless you, sir. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we look down upon these men with their sons, God, we just thank you, Lord. We just thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity, God, to be blessed. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. We bless your son. We bless you. And when you get through with your son, if you want to be blessed by a man of importance, a man of faith, and we'll have one of the staff here to do that. You do that? What's that? What do you want us to do? I want you to go find somebody that needs a blessing. All right. If you if you you want a man to bless you, a man of authority, a person on this staff, <clears throat> you dads, raise your hand. Let somebody know. Right back here. Right back here. Here's here's one here. Here's one here. Okay, Harold, we, over here. Just look at anybody that's raising their hand and you go to them as soon as you can. Give me some down here. Come here, sir. Come here, sir. Come on. Come on up here. Come on up here. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless you, my brothers. I bless you in the name of Jesus, for God has called you for such a time as this. He has prepared the way for you. Jesus loves you, He knows your heart. Jesus has so much for you to do. So go into battle. Go into battle knowing that no weapon formed against you shall prosper and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes, Lord. Bless them in Jesus' name I pray. I bless you in Jesus' name. I think we got some over here. I'm not sure. Do we have somebody else to raise their hand to be blessed by one of these men here? Here, back here. You don't realize how important a spiritual blessing is until you've had one. Until you've had a man come up and lay his hands upon you and tell you that God loves you and he loves you. Anybody else down in this section here? Yes, sir. Harold, can you go back here for this gentleman? Back here, sir? Okay. Would you? Come on, sir. You got, yeah. Come on. There you go. Well, who else? Who else? Right here, right back here. Can you get back there to see the man with his hand up? You see him there? Father, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Can I bless him? 
Can I bless him? Come here, son. Come here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless this young man, Lord. Oh, God, your anointing is all over him, God. Your anointing is on him, and he will do great things in the kingdom of God, Lord. For you have prepared him for such a time as this. I bless you, brother. I bless you in the name of Jesus. God loves you. And I bless you that you will not strafe to the right or to the left, but you will stay on the path that God lays out for you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go around here. Oh, yeah. Okay. I bless you in Jesus' name. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I bless you. God blesses you. God has his hands upon you. He loves you. You will do great things in His kingdom because you have surrendered yourself to Him. Let His anointing go before you that you might do the things that He's called you to do. I bless you. I bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. From Samoa. American Samoa meat. God bless you. Hey, brother. Okay. Okay, do we have any others that want to be blessed that have not been? You see anybody, Harold? Okay. All right. Anybody else that needs? Yeah, we got one down here, down here. Can we catch these two here? And then we're going to. Come on here. We got a couple more here. Come on, bud. You got your hand up. Yes, sir. Come on down here. Pumpkin. Oh, Harold, excuse me. Can you come up and bless this man that's coming down here now? Yes, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you. I know you don't have much time today, but my son Noah here, he's uh, he's very, very sick. He's got a very serious diagnosis, and he just needs Noah to have Kelly here today to teach his wife Haley. Where is he? He's a senior in high school. Is he here? The pastor is right here. He's got a... Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Despite what Jesus people are able to say and do for him, be you can do him, exceedingly God. abundantly for him beyond what human ability can. Jesus so, Father, name. touch him and bless him and glorify yourself. Oh, him. yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You believe. Okay. Anybody else? I don't want to leave if there's anybody here that's still looking for a blessing. Okay, come on up here. Come on up here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless you, brother. In the name of Jesus, I bless you. Let those tears flow because Jesus is blessing you right now. Not me, but the Lord himself. Because we have asked 
for a blessing upon you. And Jesus has blessed us. So stand with him. Do what he calls you to do. Serve him. And make sure that you're on the battlefield when the battle starts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. You. Bring, bring Jeff side too. All right. This is a guy, I work with this man. He's probably one of the sweetest hearted men I've ever known, let alone work with. But he can also get things going, get things moving for you. And right now, we want to chant that says something like, go God. That's his chant. So I'm going to have you lead us in a couple of go gods, and we'll stop after that, okay? Okay. Is this on? Father, we praise your holy name, and we thank you, Lord, for what yes. you've done today. We thank you for what you've done in the lives of these men. We thank you, Lord, that you're a good father that there's nothing we can do that will cause you to love us less, and there's nothing we can do that will cause you to love us more. So we say, go God. Say it with me. Go God. Go God. Say it with me. Go, go God. God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you very much.